Welcome everybody to Spirituality Adventures. This is a non-judgmental place to explore spirituality, and we're so glad you're here. This is a viewer and listener supported podcast, so we greatly appreciate your support. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Be sure and like, share, and subscribe to any of the social media content platforms that you're using. And then if you go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, you can make a one-time donation or with a monthly subscription, you'll gain access to our bonus content. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome, everybody, to Spirituality Adventures. Thanks for joining us. And uh, this is our first time to do an interview with three people, brothers and sisters, right? So mm -hmm. um, great to have you guys. We have already interviewed once before Jake Wells, Jake Wells Thompson. You got it. And then we've done an interview with Jordan Taylor Thompson. So yes. two brothers. But Brooke is joining us today. Hello. Brooke Cherith Thompson. You got it. Right again. <laughs> yeah. So this is so much fun. And I, I love the interviews that I was, you know, did with you guys previously. And so this is really fun to have your sister. So Jordan, there's five brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So we've got three of the five. Jordan's the oldest. Who's the youngest? Me. Brooke is yep. the youngest. Jake's the middle. Is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So pretty good representation here. Yeah. And then mom and dad are going to be out there listening, I guess, right? Definitely. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, um, let's, let's have our audience who hasn't, you know, maybe didn't catch the first interview kind of like orient our, our audience to your, you know, your growing up years as a family. Yeah. I think that's a good place to start, like where you're from and what your family did together for so many years. Yeah, so uh, we were born in northwestern Florida. My my dad was uh, my dad was like worked at a Christian college there. I met my mom there. Both of them are independent Baptist preachers' kids, and so they um, so you know we're kind of born into the into that world of independent Baptists. And so we lived in Pensacola for um, I guess until I was seven. So right after Brooke was born, and then. Um, moved to Niceville, Florida, and then we're in Niceville, Florida for a couple of years and then went on the road to travel and sing gospel music together. Uh, we lived in a bus and traveled around the country and sang in other independent Baptist churches for like six or seven years and then settled in Kansas City. And I think all of us have moved away from Kansas City and moved back, yeah. um, you know, at some point or another, but all of us are in Kansas City now. Okay. So yeah, that's kind of the brief overview. Yeah. So how, like, how old were you when you were traveling in a bus and you, you guys are going from basically independent Baptist church to independent Baptist church? Yeah, you got it. Coast to coast. Yeah. North to South. Yeah. Whole country. Uh, we, we never made it up into like Idaho, uh, the Dakotas, Montana, but the whole East coast, all the Midwest and, um, all, all the way out through the Southwest to the, you know, to the, to California. Okay. So, yeah. Never and Alaska, never Hawaii. Like you, do all of you have memories of good, solid memories of those six years that you traveled in that bus? Like you're all old enough to have. Yeah, I can memories. speak for myself and yeah. say yes. Yes, yeah. yeah, I for sure have memories. Yeah, like I was how, like ten to sixteen, so I I remember pretty much everything. Ten to sixteen. How old were you? Four to nine. Four to so, nine. Yeah. Were you singing at four? Yeah. Wow. Oh, she had solos. Serious? <laughs> Did I see? God, I wish we need a video. It was very cute. No, you don't need a video. <laughs> <laughs> no, what you, you know mean? when you ask the most embarrassing question for the bonus round? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's it's uh, just matching sweater vests is all I need to say. For, for that. <laughs> Did you all have, like, you matched? Yeah, we had oh, outfits and the whole the deal. Time, yeah. It was yeah. a production. Yeah. 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 Oh, man. I need a video. We'll get I just you a video, see. man. I got to we'll see. You. They're out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gosh, so you were four till four to nine to nine. You're ten to sixteen, so you're you're right in that mm -hmm. age range. Yep. What traveling on a bus together? Like, do you have any crazy, funny stories? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Jake but it, the thing is, it's like you don't, you can't you don't contextualize it as crazy until later until later when you're like oh wait you, you got that? like that whole time i was on the bus you guys were going to school and stuff right um you know so but yeah we had 
like the way you divide up your house into this is the game room and this is the these are your bedrooms and this is the main room or something we had that but it was like this is my bunk this is the back lounge with the tv and it's like a know. school bus thing no it was like, like a, a tour a bus rv yeah. Yeah. Like so technically foot. yeah okay it was a 1988 eagle um eagle tour bus yeah yeah so yeah and then like when you showed up at these churches um like you would do everybody would share different like stories different testimonies you'd sing songs was it that kind of thing we would sing songs my dad would speak okay so we we didn't we never did speaking like the speaking part we didn't publicly speak or anything like that it was kind of like go you know do you remember like your top three songs that you did everywhere you you went (laughs) yeah there's so many but the top three were definitely um my mom wrote a song called i pray for you that everybody would cry we wrote a song called, or uh, I, I don't know, did, I think mom wrote Stand for Jesus too. I was going to say, Stand for Jesus was definitely up Guaranteed, there. like stand, like people Everybody, just involuntarily yeah. stand, or voluntarily standing, <laughs> um, you know, for that number. Um, and uh, let's oh. see, uh, <laughs> number three, number three is tough to say. What's it? Uh, blind man, it's all alone. That one's pretty oh, popular. Yeah. The Jake double solo classic Dad's, on that one. Yeah. That's at some point, my song dad, about oh, the yeah. dog. My dad had humorous there. songs that he would do as like a reprieve from, you know, the mm-hmm. existential um, songs. Yeah. What was that one about? Uh, you like just you're too loud or something. You talk too much. You, you talk, talk too, too much. much. You, you worry, worry me to me. death. Yeah. You talk too much. Oh, you man. even worry my pet. I mean, it just, it, uh, it was a whole <laughs> smorgasbord of entertainment. Yeah, yeah. My dad would do that. He would do this, and this is not a reflection of my dad in his current le- level of development. But, <laughs> <laughs> but in that crowd, it was like totally okay to be like, what, you know, women talk too much, like huh, the classic thing, you know? Oh, for sure. Or habitual thing, we'll say. Um, uh, and so it, my dad would do this like real sincere, like this song goes out to the ladies, you know, like whatever. And everyone's and like, oh, this is nice. This, this is, is going to be so is, nice. Yeah. And then you talk to you talk to places like that. Got a good laugh. Uh, yeah. So um, we, I think we did a good mix. I think we did a solid mixture of, cause my dad's a songwriter. He was. And I think we, we did a solid mixture of songs that he wrote and songs that would have been a little more classic in the Southern gospel, Gaither, Southern gospel music community. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, th- I actually wasn't expecting you to, to name like songs that your dad had written. Right. I was thinking you That's, would name, right. Like just pop, you know, like Gaither pop songs or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we, and I think we did do some of those, but, uh, but I think my dad was really interested in being, and like providing something original. And so I mm-hmm. think yeah. the idea of doing the most popular Gaither song wasn't as enticing. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted to do what the Gaithers were doing, you know. He's so, a real so a true artist. Yeah. 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 Good. Well, so bring people to Kansas City. Then you guys all landed in Kansas City. Yeah. And um, so give us, like, help, help us understand what took place in your family that, that uh, caused you to not sing gospel music all around the country anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I'm How's, that? How's that to ask? You? Yeah. So, um, you know, we had been traveling on the road for five, six years and the, the like emotional toll that it takes on like a developing young mind is, was I think really stressful. Um, and so I think for the older kids, Jordan, my older brother, and then my sister, Bethany, in particular, you know, you go too long into your teenage years without a, like, legitimate friendship or any, like, grounded connection to to friends and organized uh, sports and whatever. I think it was really difficult. We were all homeschooled on the bus, and so I think... I think everyone, all of the kids were just increasingly begging my parents to stop because it it was really, it was kind of tough. We would go to a church, maybe we would go to some children's, you know, my experience was maybe I would go to some children's like time on Sunday. I would, 
have a bunch of attention because I'm some new kid that drove in on a colorful tour bus and maybe I'd meet a friend and then I'd be like, okay, if we come back next year, I'll see you next year. Here's my email address. Mm. And so I think we were all like really desperately trying like, and I, and I think my mom probably, you know, was really paying attention to that quite a bit. And, um, eventually my dad was invited to come to Kansas city to consider starting a church downtown Kansas city and play probably some music role. Um, and so we visited this, we visited this starting church in Kansas city. They invited my dad to come in and, and play a music role and other responsibilities. And, um, and so we went back to Florida, packed up our home, moved to Kansas city. And that was kind of the beginning. That was in 2008, I believe. And so that was kind of the beginning of the, the family was building, built, began building some semblance of roots in Kansas city. All right. Yeah. And the way we stopped singing together, the way we stopped kind of participating in that world is that church that, um, you know, my, our family was a part of starting, um, we got the boot from that church. And so, and that happened in, in 2008 during kind of the, I don't know, the 2008 housing crash or whatever. My mom was sick. Um, you know, we didn't know what was wrong with her, but she was like bedridden sick type of thing. And then, um, yeah, just kind of like, I think, I think everybody at the same time, parents included, maybe I was like maybe a little ahead of the curve in terms of being like, I'm, I'm over this. Um, but everybody kind of fell out of, became dis, disenchanted with the, with the organization of, of, you know, the church in general, like it kind of moved from like, this is all we, like my parents were never not employed by the church mm-hmm. to that point. And then that was the beginning of like, all right, we're not employed by the church. Don't really go to church. Um, kind of over, over that venture. And I'm, I'm just curious, um, so you go through, so did, did the whole family feel hurt? Yes. Like, you know, because you think about your mom, dad, yeah, and then five kids, all different ages, but collectively as a whole family, did, did I think, was there kind of a, a, a hurt that, that, that obviously generated that move away from the church that everybody felt? Did the whole family feel it? I think what was really difficult for me was there well there there was this sense of a betrayal of sorts but the whole time whether it be hey kids I'm going to buy a bus we're going to buy a bus and go travel and sing music or hey we're going to pack up from Florida and move to Kansas City all of like the moves that I had been a part of with the family were all it was always like Jesus is calling me God is calling us to do this this is like a higher there's a higher purpose here and so inside of the betrayal of like the feeling of betrayal, I wasn't quite sure where to put, I think. And so what came into question wasn't just the particular church or the particular person or the particular, it was like, is this Christianity as a whole? Is this God? Is this my dad? Who's responsible here? Because this doesn't, this seems fucked up. And my, so my, I, I feel like I was, I, I became like, I was, was definitely upset and angry at kind of all of the above Mm. during the experience particularly the church because i saw my mom was sick money was wildly stressful and the thing that god had called us to do just dumped us on the side of the street and now i am i am suffering like and i say this knowing the like the context of the world but my experience was I am suffering the consequences of some bullshit. I don't know what, but if God called you to do this, then why are you being punished? Why am I being punished for, you know? So there was a like a weird experience inside of that feeling mm. of betrayal. Mm. I know it looked like you had something to say there, Brooke, but I that was my experience personally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mine was definitely different just because I was younger and felt like I found out that we were even moving like later than everyone so it felt like you know I wasn't in the know maybe as much as I wanted to be uh, being younger so it was definitely a little bit different but I think the underlying feeling of like 
something hurt and something betrayed was there, whether it was super conscious or not. Mm. Yeah. This was, this was, you guys are basically, you, you've left the church and your feeling, Brooke, was, you, you felt all of that, but didn't know, you wouldn't have been able to put language around it. Yeah, I think so. I was making my exit from the family at that time, uh -huh. you know, just because of the age I was kind of launching. Right. So I was like, um, I guess necessarily self-focused at that mm -hmm. point. You know, I didn't really, I, I was like ready to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. So like the whole, everything that was going on for them, I was kind of like, that's what's going on for you. I'm, I'm making my way into mm -hmm. the world, you know. Yeah. hobbling my way out into adulthood. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so what um how did that like how did that affect your faith journey? How did what did what and I'm sure all three of you a little different, but like did it send you into a uh, a huge questioning mode? Did it send you into a you know, did you feel like atheist kind of mode or did you just question everything mode? What how did your how did your faith unravel and then let let's talk about that first how how did it unravel mm -hmm. for you and then then after we talk about that let's talk about how how what's what's emerged sure yeah yeah so i was in question mode kind of from like maybe when we started traveling on um and I think it was just because I was, ex I, I read, I had somewhat like a mentor of mine suggest blue like jazz. Okay. You know? Yeah, sure. Um, and that was the beginning of like seeing someone like seeing Donald Miller as someone who could um, pose questions to that structure, mm -hmm. you know, or make a, make a complaint or an assessment about the effectiveness or the tr like what is true mm -hmm. about that see just seeing someone be able to ask that question kind of like emboldened me to um you know start taking away things that didn't resonate mm -hmm. and my particular path with it was i took things away as they didn't resonate took things away took things away and then ended up probably in my early 20s in the place of like atheism you know mm -hmm. like a kind of a maybe a rational materialist view mm -hmm. and then you know uh, moved from there which will probably be the next yeah, section yeah. of that question but and i remember one time we were talking uh jordan and and you described that the way that sort of your faith world collapsed like a jenga i i just yeah. remember that i love that <laughs> yeah. analogy it's like you pulled out one block and then you felt like the whole the whole structure that you kind of built your faith life on it kind of just, just yeah. fell. Yeah, totally. It didn't, it didn't, not a lot of that held up. And I think, I mean, at depth, it's probably because um, the, the way I contextualize it, and we, we've talked about Wilbur a little bit, but like the way I contextualize it is literally my, um, myself as a philosophical being changing um its um operating system from like a more mythic like uh ju like kind of just believe the things that we believe in order to get um you know to the right afterlife to um to uh maybe having a more rational look at that stuff and a lot of the even even what's real about the or even what is um effective or meaningful about the beliefs that emerged in the mythic structure didn't hold up to a rational inquiry and so i kind of had to like shore up that rational part of myself to reflect on okay what's the what do i what do i resonate with here mm -hmm. you know what do i and like the jenga thing is like as soon as you as soon as i noticed myself as a um well i'm i'm using the term mythic like a specialized term in mm -hmm. that context but as soon as i noticed myself just believing things in order to believe them 
uh, all the magic disappears mm -hmm. and that's the jenga is like yeah. oh yeah i pull one thing i pull one, i start pulling this strand just a little bit and there's not a whole lot of my worldview that isn't sitting on um um what is essentially a thought that i mm. identify with like a yeah. belief yeah you know? how about you guys what when if you think about how, how did it how did your faith journey sort of meltdown or I don't know. Yeah, I like, don't. What, how did you question it? I think it happened for me a little bit later, like after we had left Kansas City. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think I think even still maybe a little bit, I have just um, like shut it off instead of, you know, searching like I, I'm not searching for anything. I'm just kind of like, I don't really want to deal with that, <laughs> you know, so that's kind of where I still sit. I think, mm -hmm. yeah. Did you, did you go through Brooke a time when you definitely felt like you were all in uh, faith yeah. wise with yeah. the with the evangelical Christian world? For sure. And then I did mean, you, did you definitely feel like there was a time when you sort of d disengaged from that? Was yeah. Um, I mean, from early on, like I I believe I was baptized, like pretty early on like not really with my I don't remember it I don't really remember mm -hmm. making that conscious decision um and so I definitely like followed blindly um fear-based for probably until I was in like seventh grade is when I started to be like well that's not I don't really feel good believing that mm -hmm. and then I and then I kind of started to while out a little bit mm -hmm. so yeah 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 all right. Fred, for me, I feel like I initially, initially, I, f I feel like my, my resolve was strengthened inside of, inside of my faith and my, my desire to like, um, walk through, be a Christian, mm -hmm. like my fervor or whatever. Um, so, I mean, initially, I think when everything was going, you know, when, when the initial sort of upset um, started happening for my dad with the, at the church, you know, I was, uh, do you know IHOP, International House of Prayer? I do. Okay. So I was, I was, I mean, I don't really know how to say this. I was like really proudly, I would call myself a Jesus freak. Mm -hmm. I was really proudly like excited about this. And I would, I had a. I had multiple friends who we would study scripture. So mm -hmm. I was becoming very astute, like mm -hmm. really, I kind of was starting to lean on my intellect a little bit because I realized it was like, oh, if I, you know, if I really believe this, I, I want to understand, I want to be able to dismantle any argument that may oppose me philosophically or ideolo ideologically. Mm -hmm. I would like to be able to stand up inside of any context in this I, I, that's that's mm -hmm. always been very important to me mm. and um so you know studying revelation and all these scriptures and like coming back with notes i was really excited and then this weird thing happened we moved to colorado after um <clears throat> you know everything kind of shook out and played out my mom was still terribly ill so we moved to colorado i think to kind of escape kansas city and also you know we knew it was going to be really nice for my mom to be close to her twins so we were like mm -hmm. this seems like a great place to go we moved to colorado and my experience was like moving from this you know ultra suburban home as the middle child in this family i have outlets i've got i have a sports team i played drums for my brother's new rock band i had friend circles everywhere i was i was engaged in music as much as i wanted to be you know my house was always a really musical house when we lived in this suburban home, it was like instruments everywhere and all these things. And all of a sudden I found myself in Colorado in this stinky fucking town with in a trailer. I'm the oldest. So my older brother and my older sister were left behind. My mom is sick. We're poor. We don't have any instruments. I don't have any friends. I don't know anybody. There are no sports. There's no outlet. I don't, I don't play music anymore. There's nothing. And I am, and everyone is terribly sad in my house mm. everyone is terribly angry and frustrated and sad mm. and i'm the oldest mm. now 
Mm. And I, I became, I, I got to experience my first sort of wow, my second round of depression. Um, but that one was like very intense um, for me. Mm. The experience of like kind of for the first time being like just fantasizing about dying, just fantasizing about not being there was like my reality for a while, for months. And um, and inside of that is this crazy desire to be a Christian, this crazy desire to like, I want to know, like I want this to be where I want to believe that this is like somehow I've got, you know, all things work together for God, you know, and it's like trying to do this. And then all of a sudden, like a anvil fell on my head was like these Christian colored glasses fell from my face and I started looking around at reality going, oh, everything that I believe about this actually isn't most, doesn't seem most likely. Maybe it is, but all of a sudden every answer that I give to every question is like, well, that doesn't seem most probable. That doesn't seem like that adds up. Uh, that doesn't make sense. I can't fit that reality into my idea of God. And the, and this reality that that God is a part of, I don't want to be a part of that God. Oh, shit. What am I going to do? You know, like, what do you do? And so my deconstruction was really interesting. And then it like from there, you know, built this massive amount of resentment mm. toward what I felt like was an embarrassment on my intellect. How could I not have seen this before? Mm. How... Jake, you're so, and so all this like yeah. judgmental stuff comes, then comes, you know, you read a little bit of Nietzsche and it's like, <laughs> ah, I think I'm definitely a nihilist. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh shit. Well, yeah, you read that with, and then watch fight club. And- exactly. <laughs> or like, what's the <laughs> clockwork orange or something, you know? Oh, yeah. And I, and so like, for, and so it was really interesting that the, the nihilism didn't, doesn't stand up very, very much, very, very well um, to like if you want to like uh in my opinion so it went from there to like atheism to buddhism and pantheism like just kind of exploring all these ideas and then and then after that i'm going through high school being a kid study some philosophy and but that that experience of of go doubling down on my faith and then that doubling down almost added to this embarrassment Mm. of who i had been and who i was yeah and that was really where the real deconstruct that was where it was for me interesting so interesting isn't it um you know i I shared with you before we started that um i i've been getting to know uh, brian mclaren who's written a lot of books and one of his most recent books is called faith after doubt and you know he's taken like you know wilbur has all these developmental phases of of sort of faith journey and you have all this adult development so you there's a lot of thinkers in that space mm-hmm. in psychology and and even in the religious world like wilmer mm-hmm. have developed these um sort of phases of growth and uh mclaren and his faith after doubt book just kind of boiled it boiled those down into four stages that it kind of resonated with me i mean there's always can be a little danger in making stages you know right mm-hmm. yeah. how you think about them and all that but the first stage is what he just calls simplicity and it's how all of us grow up i mean we all have a, people that raise us they teach us you know what's right and wrong who's in and out you know it, it's just the real simple rules of life and you kind of learn your tribe and learn the rules and what's you know what what is and isn't kind of but sim- very dualistic very black and white you know very very simple and then and then he says then oh, and some people stay in that you know their whole life like they their answers that they got as kids for their faith and mm-hmm. and, and their worldview is like what they live with the rest of their life and they die in that right yeah then there's the second phase he calls complexity which that's where you begin to realize holy crap this is this is quite complex mm-hmm. and then you can then you can double down a little bit and try to become an apologist and figure out all the answers totally to yeah. defend your faith and yeah, all totally. of the things you know and like you can spend a lifetime in that i mean i you know i was a pastor of a mega church for a lot of years you know and you know mm-hmm. i you know you you come up with all kinds of answers for the complexity you have the that's answer you have an answer on tap for, <laughs> for like uh you know, you know but then how 
does suffering happen? Exactly. You know, when you're like, I, I got this. Don't worry. Yeah, and then and then so and people stay in that phase, right? And then then you have what he calls perplexity, which is typically when something happens mm -hmm. that it's like the Jenga phase where mm -hmm. something happens, just it, it kind of all falls apart. Yeah, and then you're in. And you're searching, you're in perplexity, you can get super cynical, you know, you can like get angry, mm -hmm. you know, uh, from, I mean, in 2019, like here, I, you know, I'd been a pastor for 40 years, you know, and then I'm like feeling like an atheist. And if God exists, well, it's like, well, I was, if he's, then I'm angry, you know, like I was like, mm -hmm. Ooh, super totally. angry. Totally. Yeah, oh, man. It's like, well, wait, what's after, per, what's after perplexity? Yeah. So then he says, and so then, he, he, and it, this isn't like he's not trying to say this is all superior or anything like that, right? But but, but he call he's trying to call it harmony, hmm. where people are, you know, because like even like even we we grow up with all these Christian stories and these Christian scriptures and these Christian metaphors and Buddhist kids grow up with that and Hindu kids grow up with that, mm -hmm. and it happens. It's it's not just a Christian thing. These stages. It's it's a human thing, right? All right. humans go through this. All human parents teach their kids some kind of worldview about mm -hmm. the world that they live in and they're growing up in. And yeah. you know, one of uh, one a, a Hindu friend. You know, the Hindus have this little book of children books about the Hindu gods and they all have blue faces. Yeah. You know, the Hindu kids going, do all gods have blue faces? And then like the parents trying to, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, honey, you know, and like Brian McLaren says, you know, when you're a parent trying to teach your kid about God, it's kind of like talking to your kid about sex. Mm. Like you don't want to tell them too much and traumatize them. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but you don't want right. you know, <laughs> right. to, you know, you want to give them what they can handle. And then when they grow up, they don't think you're a total liar, you know, mm. like, a, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know complicated. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, but yeah, he says harmony. So like you begin to reintegrate and reimagine all of these images because these these religious images are almost like our our native language. Like, we, yeah. you know, I my my heart language is English, mm -hmm. but the the spiritual language that formed me was definitely from a Jesus Bible Christian. I have thousands of verses memorized. Well, then now, as I go back and revisit that mm -hmm. from a after going through perplexity yeah. and feeling like it all fell apart, yeah. then I kind of reimagine. And then I'm, I like to say I'm less certain and more open right now than ever before, but try to be gracious about all those phases and yeah, because it's a part of the human cycle. So yeah, so yeah. that's what he's calling harmony. And then there's harmony. so many of us like parents are like parents in that phase are like going, well, how do I raise my kids? <laughs> Right? Yeah. Jordan? Yeah, bro. <laughs> You're a dad, bro. I'm a dad. Dude. <laughs> you know? Yeah, for real. Well, I mean, it's like, yeah, you mentioned something that's like, um, you mentioned something that's like, it's when you have a stage theory, yeah. it's so important to, I mean, there's an initial, there's an initial comfort with having any context to like map reality. Exactly. Into. Right. But then you can make the mistake of like confusing the map with the terrain. Exactly. In terms of like, well, you're interacting with life, man. Exactly. This thing is like, yeah. it's not something you can get your head around. And just because you have a context you can fit it into doesn't make it any, mm -hmm. you know. So, I mean, I've noticed that in myself, like going to, you know, becoming at least educated to the view of like the spiral dynamics or mm -hmm. the st the stages of development yeah. or anything like exactly. that exactly gravitating to the comfort of having a label for a given stage mm -hmm. or whatever and more recently like noticing the importance of not um not elevating the map above the terrain you know it's like exactly. i'm still with life and this is yeah. and this is like this might be a useful way to contextualize some things in life, but it's not life, you know, it's not yeah. what it represents. And then there's, there's also a, like the, I was talking to a friend who's a student of similar stuff, you know, sim mm -hmm. we've had a similar life path. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's the person that I went on that hitchhiking journey with. I don't know if I talked to you about that hitchhiking journey. You did. Had, but mm -hmm. so and then, was, and then Jake went on one too. Yeah. Jake yeah. went on one too. Yeah. The friends. Did so, you go on one, bro? No, not yet. <laughs> not in a way. Not yet. Watch out. Brooks had her own adventures. <laughs> yeah. But like I was talking to him and, and we were just working through some stuff in that way. And it was like, there's like this, for people who are wired up, you know, maybe similar to me, where it's really important to explore and 
uh, know as much as you can while being committed to not knowing, you know, like be in that, in that existential kind of working out all the time, mm-hmm. you know, it's really easy to think that, um, the next stage is the better one. Yeah. Exactly. You know, that's what I mean by oh, the that's danger. A better one. Yeah. yeah. Creating mm-hmm. a hierarchy out of these stages. Yeah. Like it's not okay for somebody to just kind of have us a, a simple, um, a simpler or more concise worldview that works for them to move through life that isn't dysfunctional for them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like destroying their life right. or something. It's right. like, and maybe not hurting a ton of other people in the yeah, process. You yeah. Know, which, uh, it's like, yeah, it's not like one is better than the other. And the way that I've started to think about it is it, it's less like the next phase is the best phase because you got big enough to be in that phase and more like, um, the next phase is just an inevitability of like getting what there is to get out mm-hmm. of this one, you know? And that's just what's coming. It's not better. Yeah. It's not, it's not, um, there are unique problems that emerge in e- each of those things, mm-hmm. you know? Like you said, how do you raise your kids from that harm, the stage of harmony, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't have an answer, but it's like, that's right. a unique problem because you know sure as hell how to raise your kids in this. I have so many friends right now that are raising kids that have gone through this type of deconstruction and they're like, like what, what do we teach our kids? You know, mm. I mean, it's, it's so interesting. And, and I love that little analogy. It's, it's kind of like, like talking to your kids about sex. Yeah. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that wild? Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about yeah, it. Yeah. Like age yeah. appropriate transparency, uh-huh. yeah. you know, what do you, how do you work that so out? So what is, you know, I'd have kids come into me and ask the hardest questions all the time as, you know, the parents would bring them to me the pastor has the answer, you know, well, mm. where did God come from? You know, Easy. <laughs> I got well, this. well, Timmy, God's always existed. <laughs> oh, okay. I get it now. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> no more questions. 13.8 million years ago. <laughs> oh, and his face is blue. Well, his face yeah. is blue. <laughs> it's very important that you remember that. If somebody Anyway. tells you they're God and they don't have a blue face, <laughs> yeah, don't get out of there. there. If you get a book and it doesn't say Holy Bible, it's the wrong book, man. Don't take it. <laughs> it hasn't been vetted by the That's appropriate right. council, yeah. who unfortunately disbanded <laughs> a while ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, you know, and I thought, I thought too. I think the harder you believe, the harder you fall. Yeah. Or the the harder your harder your deconstruction. So like you think about it, did, like did you ever meet kids along the way that like they were in church and stuff, but they just didn't take it that seriously. That's our brother Josh. Totally. Like it just didn't really matter to them. They yeah, never totally. took it seriously. And so yeah. they don't really deconstruct from much. Dude, I was so jealous of Josh. You know what I'm like, saying? I remember asking my brother who's in between <laughs> Jake and Brooke, I said, dude, did you like did you always because I see in him the part of himself he's so um Josh is very thoughtful and his reality is much more grounded in his experience than consulting the the agreed upon experience of others, you know, at least from where I am. And I was like, dude, have you always, have you always like trusted that part of yourself, you know, that just kind of knew if something wasn't, was off. And he was like, oh yeah. Yeah. Like I never, I never was really fully in, you know? And I was like, I'm so jealous, yeah. dude. Yeah, me too. Isn't that interesting? Well, it makes sense because like you, how much of your identity are you putting into this belief? And so the more of yourself that you put into what you believe, the more that has to die when it deconstructs. Yeah. And then the death is like, it's not so much that it hurts to die. It hurts to know it's like the implication of you dying is, I think, is where the, the pain comes from and the discomfort. Mm-hmm. It's the implication that something needed to die because it was, there was some, it, like, I feel like it's evidence of some misstep, of some mistake. Yeah. And that, I think, can be painful for people. Yeah. It was for me. Yeah. And I, I'm, what I'm, and I've tried to be honest with my journey with, with the people that are paying attention anymore, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, it's like I'm just trying to say, hey, questions and doubt and even unbelief aren't the enemy of faith. Mm-hmm. Like, there, it's a part of the faith journey, right? Yeah. And and um, maybe certainty and dogma is the enemy of faith. I don't know. It's certainly inconsistent with the 
concept of faith, like certainty and certainty is. I like to say I'm less certain and more open these days. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm like happy with that. Yeah. And so, and in some ways I feel like a kid again, right. In terms of learning and growing and all that kind of stuff. And then still, still trying to reintegrate my life and move forward with it, you know? So Mm -hmm. it's interesting stuff. Well, um, let's talk about music. All right. So you kind of have this musical career all like, are you musical Brooke? Yeah. Are you still, do you write music? Yeah, I do. I'm in a band. Um, I do stuff on my own. I work at a music store. I'm surrounded by music for sure. Sweet. Brooke is like the sleeper agent at this moment because both of us have said this. We're like, dude, if, if anybody has a chance in the big game, from our family, like the big music game, is this one. Brooke? <laughs> oh, yeah. Sweet. Oh, yeah. She's like, yeah. Know. No, yeah, I mean, you you would have to say that to, to that <laughs> level of a compliment. Have you have to say. to say You can't be like, that's right. You're right. So um, let, let's have people, like, if they want to jump in on your music right now mm-hmm. and get, you know, where do they go? Let's do that real quick. And then we'll, then we'll talk about. Jake should answer that. And we're going to have you do some music here in, in a minute. So nice. Um, yeah. Jake, Jake Wells is my, is where you can find Jake Wells online. Um, Jordan and I also have a, a custom songwriting business called the creative Wells. And so we have a website called the creative wells.com and that houses um, a lot of our custom songs that we've done. Um, but under Jake Wells, you'd find an album where Jordan and I um, brought together a lot of the custom songs that we've done. But Jordan and I have been doing music, you know, since the beginning of me doing music on my own, essentially. Um, and so he, he's kind of all over my catalog, and I'm and I'm somewhat in, you know, in his. The three of us just did an EP as well called the Siblings EP, which you can find on Jake's. Which uh, you, Spotify, which so. I think you didn't know this, but you heard. I mean, when you, I assume you heard the new version of Born Again that we did. Is that Roll Like Thunder? You mean? No, I meant too. Born Again. No, I know. I just I haven't heard the newest version. Okay, Brooke oh, okay, sings in the new version of Born Again that I think you would you would Okay, uh, no, I haven't listened to that one. It's the it's what that song deserved to be. Like the one that was released before that mm-hmm. was uh, a oh. live recording of a of a like so, of an a, acoustic set that, an acoustic mm-hmm. session that I just had Jake come in and right. sit with me on. But as soon as we did that song with the three of us, it was like mm. that song's like complete now. Can you do that today? Yeah, we'll do it today. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. It's beautiful though. Like if then I we released that last month, and so go go like search Jake Wells, and the the latest release is the Sibling CP. Okay. There's another single coming out tomorrow, but the the latest release is a Sibling CP with two songs, and that's with Jordan Brooke and myself reimagining Born Again and another song Roll Like Thunder. Yeah, I love the Roll Like I I love your your music I, I i'm gonna have to listen to yours now brooke but um you know i love some of the th- the way you mix in some of the themes of nature whether it be water or whether it be i don't know they're you're uh, i don't know you mix nature themes in yeah like some of the elemental things yeah um, the water water was largely jake um, was it with that stuff? But then, yeah, I think we're. We I'm big. Like, what's I'm, the one that you did? Mystic something or other? No, oh. in the in the what's, indigo sea. Indigo, indigo sea. sea. That's yeah, yeah, one yeah, of yeah, my yeah. favorites. Yeah, that yeah, he's yeah such that a good one. Song. I love yeah. that song. Yeah. 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 So good. And the wa- I love dun, 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 the water. Yeah. At any rate, those those speak to me, and I love the born again. The first time I I listened to that, I just go, oh, holy crud! This mm-hmm. is like because I wasn't expecting the turn that the song took. Okay, cool. You know? Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. yeah, that was like the that was like the beginning of like, all right, I'm making I'm making peace with this thing. I'm like giving it I'm giving it what it I'm giving that domain all of the value that it had for me and I'm taking back what I'd like to have back and that's that. That's a great reimagination, I think, of you know, capturing a journey that you're on and then reimagining it moving forward and still hanging on to some metaphors, just using them in a different way. Totally. Yeah. And the very tone cool. of the song, yeah, that, yeah the yeah. tone of the song calls to that. I mean, yeah. calls to that space. It's very much, um, it's, it's like a worshipful song, mm-hmm. you know, in the way that it's delivered. And 
I, I, I love worship music. Like I've even at my most atheist type of phase mm -hmm. would still like sit in on the guitar for a worship session at a church, actually some vineyard churches. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, just because I love the, I love the experience of that mm -hmm. music and the surrender that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. That Brooke. was always wild to me. I feel like I would, I, I mean, I'm certain that I would have like a, a, like a mental breakdown if I were a part of a, of a, really? like a Christian, like a normal church music service. Mm pretty sure i would lose it don't do it for some i won't for some people the <laughs> the the hurt and trauma was so deep that just to revisit it is triggering mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying yeah um but i do think that there's a i think revisiting trauma in a health you know in a healing way and then reintegrating mm -hmm. and you do it in incrementally yeah, right size. sure right is a part of the healing process so i do think there's something to that but yeah i i i hear you yeah. um i would certain do it like situations the, like, i, I want to do i want to figure it out because there's a big part of me that's like oh i would love to be a worship leader mm -hmm. that would be so much fun <laughs> so I, man. I i the church that i go to when i go is a black church mm -hmm. and it's black gospel so it's totally outside my tradition you know mm -hmm. And and it's quite healing because they talk about darkness and slavery and mm -hmm. bondage and all of that. Those images mm -hmm. um, that kind of like like for me and what I'd gone through, it, it, mm -hmm. it kind of it was healing for me to just sit there totally and be, be the one black guy in a yeah, the black about community, people, like you know? the music yeah. and the one white guy. Yeah, that's in a, in what a, I gathered. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we should talk after this, you know? It's okay, so I'm Grandma. I'm transforming, let's get actually. You to I'm bed. transforming, you know? <laughs> Hanging out. I was in Ethiopia last October, so I'm, yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Brooke, where, oh, where do we find your music? Mm -hmm. um, currently, I'm a featured artist, so I have nothing of my own out. Um, you can find some, like, songs that I did like four or five years ago on SoundCloud. But other than that, just look out for um, stuff coming soon. Yeah. Would, would they go to Instagram? Where um, would they find you? It'll be you? on Spotify. So it'll be under Brooke Cherith. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Spell it for everybody. Brooke, Brooke uh, Cherith is C-H-E-R-I-T-H. -E okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she is on. She did sing on the, so on the right, song. Yeah. yeah. Featured okay. on this EP, featured yeah. on another... Um, album that actually jordan and i worked on with a friend jay um so that stuff's on spotify under a portfolio um but yeah yeah stuff coming soon though for sure and, and you're doing a new band right now as well yes yeah, so we got a new band that's uh coming off the blocks right now one single out it's called the sunrex uh, sunrex is one word s-u-n-w-r-e-c-k-s -E and uh we're here to warn you that the Andromeda Galaxy is coming. Yes. <laughs> no, the, yeah, the, the imagery of it was like, the imagery of it was picturing like a, if, if the galaxies collided at like a, if we could look at it in fast motion, you know, how mm -hmm. cool it would be to see all this, you know, things mm -hmm. happen. Like the inevitability of that is cool. And then um, that's where that imagery came from. Um, but that, I mean, it's just a cool band name. That's really what it is. But that is more of like, that is, my what did you say like my it's jordan desire baby to it's unleash jordan. The, yeah <laughs> just it's unleashing jordan. the beast man the just wrath. like mm -hmm. going for it and like un, yeah unleash, unleashing the wrath um it's within good. yeah 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 but it's melodic it's not like it's not like screaming or like metal or something okay. it's still holding to where like do they find that where do they go spotify itunes or apple music what do they um, type in the sunrex Okay. Yeah, the Sunrex. It'll All be right. there. We're the only band. And then what about your your solo stuff? Solo stuff is under J Taylor. Um, so J period space Taylor. Um, just okay. all all regular spelling there. And um, yes, yeah, some of the so that that catalog is tied to Jake's not only through Jake's catalog but through the custom songs that he was mentioning. Um, mm -hmm. So we've been basically taking clients um, that have like a relationship or a story in their life or maybe a a loss or something like that that they want a piece of music to like speak to and we'll interview the client and then do like go into the studio for a few weeks and write something and record it for them um so the, that music you can find um either in 
either of our catalogs, the Jay Taylor catalog or Jake Wells, or you can find it on the creativewells.com. Mm. So awesome. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, we're going to have them uh, do a close with a, with a song or two. So, all right. The music the music question's a mouthful. We just named like six projects. I know. Right. It's like, well, we're... <laughs> I know. So, do you guys do music? Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah. I'm in four projects today. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thanks well, for Well, as long as people yeah. can uh, just just find it. So, I like, I, I've had so many people because, uh, you know, have love like born again Mm -hmm. because you did that i think when you were here last and like i don't know so anyway i know that there's listeners who will want to find the new stuff there's a lot of beautiful there's a lot of beautiful music in both in everyone's catalogs there's a lot of beautiful things to be heard awesome yeah all right well let's let's do it cool uh this next song is called kansas heat you should do that and introduce yourself. My name is Brooke Cherith, and this song is called Kansas Heat. I've got a bone to pick. Cause this doesn't feel too sweet I haven't been home in a few Had someone look after me I got my memories Most of them tear me down Like when I'm underwater And my lungs don't have space to breathe I left my bones on the freeway In the Kansas heat Oh, it's after me Oh, it's chasing me down I left my bones on the freeway In the Kansas heat With the best in Now I've got some shit to lose Like the lover who tends to me In the morning here What a season to see How I moved in a mess Looking for some kind of rest Freeway in the Kansas heat. Oh, it's after me. Oh, it's chasing me down. I left my bones on the freeway in the Kansas heat with the best in me. Oh, I'm chasing you down. Chasing you down Could someone look after me Look after me It's burning me up It's burning me up Could someone look after me Look after me it's burning me up. Me up. look after me, look after me. It's burning me up. It's burning me up. Cause someone look after me, cause I'm burning up. I left my bones on a freeway in the Kansas heat.
That was beautiful, bro. All right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning into Spirituality Adventures and thanks for doing your music. So that's beautiful. I love your music. Roll like thunder. Awesome. Uh, for those who are into our bonus content, uh, they'll also be doing a new s- or a song that Brooke wrote called Kansas Heat. And then one of my favorites, Born Again, that mm-hmm. Jordan wrote. So thank you guys so much. And we will see all of you next time. Thanks for tuning in. This concludes today's episode. Thanks for tuning in and listening. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Remember to like, share, or subscribe to the social media platform that you're using. And then go to our website, spiritualityadventures.com, and make a one-time donation. Or you can subscribe monthly and receive our special bonus content. Thanks so much.